Well, very good evening and a very warm welcome to our evening service on this beautiful warm day. Uh, good to see you all. It's always good to gather together around the Word of God because we always find something to take away with us and to help us. The, there's no change in the situation. There will be a, a, a facing in the, in the strategy of the lockdown. So we're just going day to day, finding out how that goes. It's different in Scotland to England. Also, just a reminder, oh, here's Will. A, a reminder that on Tuesday, we have the Road to Recovery with Carol Monteith from Seacast Highlands, the addictions worker, and she will be speaking for us. Uh, prayer meeting, God willing, will be myself, by the grace of God, and uh, we've got the emergency food bank open for anyone who needs any help. And uh, the details are on our Facebook page. You can, if people approach you about this, let them know and they can phone us. Well, with that, we will begin our worship of the Lord by singing to his praise in the Scottish Psalter and from Psalm 34. We'll sing 10 verses from verse 1. God will I bless all times his praise. My mouth shall still express. My soul shall boast and God the meek shall hear with joyfulness. The lion's young may hungry be and they may lack their food, but they that truly seek the Lord shall not lack any good. We'll sing this psalm. God will I bless all times his praise. <coughs> God will I bless all times his praise, my mouth shall still express, my soul shall boast in God the meek, shall hear with joyfulness, extol the Lord with me, let us Exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, he held and did me from all fears delivered. They looked to him and light and wear, not shame and wear their faces. This poor man cried, God help and save him from all his distresses. The angel of the Lord encamps and drowned and compasses all those about that do and them deliver us. For taste and see that God is good, to trust in him is blessed. Fear God is saints, none that him fear shall be with one so the lion's young may hungry be, but they may lack their food. But they that truly seek the Lord shall not lack any We'll pray together. Let's pray. 
our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together, Lord. We thank you that you've drawn us together around your word once again. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would make yourself known to us according to your word. That teaches us where there are two or three gathered together in your name. You have promised that you will be with us. We thank you, Lord, that your word is truth. And you have promised that indeed, Lord, you are with us always, even unto the end of the age. But we pray this evening, Lord, that the promise of the blessing for us as a church would be ours tonight, Lord, and that you would manifest, Lord, your blessing in each heart, and that you would lead us in the way that we should go. We ask, O oh Lord, that our eyes would be opened, that we could look heavenward, and that we might behold the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We thank you, Father, that you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, we are the children of God, and that we can come to you as children to a Father. And we pray, Lord, that this evening, Lord, we would have that sense of uh, belonging to God, and being here in your plan and purpose, and being part of the bigger scheme of things, Lord, in our own little way. We thank you, Father, for the blessing we have of singing your praises. We thank you, Lord, that here tonight we have the opportunity, Lord, to sing, to pray, to have your word read and declared to us. And we pray, Lord, that the words of my lips and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight here tonight, Lord. We do confess, Lord, our sinfulness. We confess, Lord, that we are so prone to sin. And we ask, Lord, that this evening, that you would bless us with forgiveness according to your word. You have said, if we are faithful to confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us. And we come to you, Lord, confident that you are the faithful God who loves us. And we thank you for your mercy in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. This evening, Lord, we pray as your word goes out here to our fellowship, to our congregation, that you would, Lord, minister to each of us in a wonderful way, that you would inhabit the praises of your people, that you would take the things of God and Christ and open up our understanding to see great and wonderful things in your law, Father. And Lord, our God, we do praise you and thank you that your word is being declared in other groups like this, small groups and very large groups, Lord. We do praise you and thank you, Lord, that the word of God is not bound. We are reminded, Lord, of the Apostle Paul, how he was bound, chained to a guard at all times and yet he reminded us the word of god is not bound and we thank you lord that the word of god is what is truth the word of god is life and we thank you lord that you've told us that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free we pray this evening lord that we would have a true sense of the Lord Jesus Christ as God's beloved Son, speaking to us, ministering to us, and calling us to himself. We pray, Lord, that you would bless your people to the ends of the earth, that you would build them up, encourage them, equip them, Lord, 
on whatever your word is declared tonight, Lord. We pray, Father, there would be a wonderful blessing and that many who do not know you, Lord, would come to faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the wonderful love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We thank you for the Apostle Paul's words. And Lord, all believers can truly speak these words, knowing that they apply to each believer. That the life we live now, we live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We pray tonight that sinners everywhere would have a, a grasp in some measure, Lord, of the wonderful breadth, height, length, and depth of the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We pray this evening, Lord, for a world that is in crisis. We pray for the nations, Lord, that there would be a stabilizing of the corona scare, Lord, and the uh, corona crisis. We pray progress would be made in the research and in the treatment of it, Lord, and in the isolation of the virus itself, Lord, and that a, a true vaccine would be found, Lord, soon, and that people would be protected from the COVID, especially we think of elderly, those with underlying illnesses, Lord, the very young, and those who are immunocompromised, Lord. Father God, protect each soul. Protect everyone connected with us as a congregation and as families. We pray for the protection of God as a wall of fire around us and around our uh, extended families, Lord. And Lord, we're mindful that there are many others, Lord, who are struggling with so much more uh, uh, in terms of afflictions, Lord, plus the added risk of COVID. So we pray tonight, Lord, for those to be helped. We especially think of Nan. We pray your blessing upon her, Lord. We pray that you would comfort her and that you would strengthen her, Lord, and that, Father, you would take from her this affliction that is so uh, paining on her and her family. We pray for strength for her body, Lord, for her bones, her muscles, and that, Lord, she would be able to eat without being uh, nauseous or without being uh, feeling like she has no appetite. We pray, Father, that you would restore her appetite and restore the nourishment to our body, Lord. And our Father, we pray for those who take care of the sick. Thank you for them. We think of Margaret and her colleagues, and we think of Laura and her colleagues, and indeed, Lord, all the, all the care workers that are working in places up and down the country, Lord. Keep them safe, bless them, and help them, Lord. And our Father, we thank you for them. And we pray that our government would be wise in the way that it deals with this situation, that it would continue to be uh, tentative, and yet, Lord, continue to be confident and very clear in the strategies laid out. And we pray, praise you, Father, for the good news that so many homeless people have been provided for. And in fact, it has woken the government up to actually put the thousands of supported homes out. Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray that it would be a benefit to many in these days, Lord. And our Father, we think of the gospel uh, as it's going out uh, in the various nations, Lord that governments would sit up and take heed, and, Lord, that leaders would seek you, and that the populations of nations would seek you. And, Lord, we pray as your people that we would continue to seek you and to bless you, Lord. We remember Susan. Lord, be with her. Encourage her, Lord. Bless her, and thank you for her faith, Lord. We pray her legs would be better, Lord.
and that her uh, mobility would be better and that, Lord, her spirit would be bright and that she would be ministered to in your tender mercy, Lord. Be with Nora and Katrina, Lord. You know their situation, Lord. You know the difficulties they face. And we pray, Father, that you be around them and with them, Lord, to strengthen them and provide them in all their needs, Lord. We remember students, Lord, who are studying. We ask, O oh Lord, that you'd give them all the help they need as they study uh, from a distance, Lord. And that, Father, that this would be in no way detrimental to their to their advancement in studies, but rather, Lord, that they would find it a blessing and very fruitful. Be with us then tonight, Lord, as a congregation. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would minister to each heart, Lord, exactly what we need here tonight. And we pray that you would be glorified in it, Lord, and that when we go from each other, Lord, that we could truly acknowledge from our hearts that it was good for us to have been here together this evening, Lord. And we do pray these things in the precious name of Jesus, with the forgiveness of all our sins, for his sake. Amen. We will sing our next item of praise now, which is, again, a beautiful hymn across the land. Sorry? Oh. Trying to get back in, and Neil's trying to join as well. Uh, there's nobody coming up on my side here. I've got, I've got no, I've got no indication of anyone waiting to get in, Eric. <coughs> tell, I, tell them to log in, and I'll keep an eye, and we'll, uh, <coughs> I'll, I'll let them log out and log in again and I'll let them in. Okay, we're going to sing our hymn, You're the Word of God the Father, from before the world began, every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. We'll sing this to God's praise. Okay, I think we've got Krisha back with us. You word of God the Father, from before the world began, every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You, the author of creation, you, the Lord of every man, and your cry of love rings out across the lands. Yet you let the gaze of angels came to seek and save the lost and exchange the joy of heaven for the anguish of a cross. With a prayer you fed the hungry, with a word you still do see, yet how silently you suffered that the guilty may go free. You're the author of creation, you're the Lord of every man, and your cry of love brings out across the lands. With a shout you rose victorious, wrestling victory from the grave, and descended into heaven, 
leading captives in your wake. Now you stand before the Father, interceding for your own. From each tribe and tongue and nation, you are leading sinners home. You're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. And your cry of love rings out across the land. Our reading tonight is uh, in the book of Second Kings. We were in First Kings in the morning, Second Kings, and it's at chapter seven. Second Kings, chapter seven, and we'll read the whole chapter from verse one. But Elisha said, "Hear the word of the Lord." Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a sale of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then the captain on whose hand the king leaned said to the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows on heaven, could this thing be? But he said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance to the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, let us enter the city, the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. So now come, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, Behold, there was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they fled in the twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank. They carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they came and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, we came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no one to be seen or heard. There was nothing but the horses tied, and the donkeys tied, and the tents as they were. Then the gatekeeper called out, and it was told within the king's household. And the king rose in the night and said to his servants, I will tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the open country, thinking when they come out of the city, we shall take them alive 
and get into the city. And one of his servants said, let some men take five of the remaining horses, seeing that those who are left here will fare like the whole multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let us send and see. So they took two horsemen, and the king sent them after the army of the city and saying, Go and see. So they went after them as far as the Jordan, and behold, all the way was littered with garments and equipment that the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. So a sea of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the captain on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gate, so that he died as the man of God had said, when the king came down to him. For when the man of God had said to the king, two seahs of barley shall be sold for a shekel, and a seah of fine flour for a shekel, about this time tomorrow in the gate of Samaria. The king had answered the man of God. If the, the captain had answered the man of God. If the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he had said, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. Amen. And we pray the Lord will bless that reading of his own precious and holy word to us. And to his own name be honor, praise, and glory. We're going to, once again, sing from the Psalms, the Scottish Psalter in Psalm 3. O Lord, from verse 1, how are my foes increased against me? Many rise, many say of my soul for him in God, no succor lies. Salvation doth appertain unto the Lord alone, thy blessing, Lord, forevermore, thy people is upon. We'll sing this psalm to the praise of God. Amen. O Lord, how are my foes increased against me, many rise. Many say of my soul for him in God. No succor lies, yet thou my shield and glory art the uplifter of my head. I cry, and from his holy hill the Lord me answer me. I laid me down and slept, I waked, for God sustained me. I will not fear for thousands ten set round against me be. Arise, O Lord, save me, my God, for thou my foes hast drawn. All on the cheekbone and the teeth of wicked men hast thrown. Salvation unto the Lord alone. Thy blessing, Lord, forever, Lord, thy people is upon. Amen. 
<clears throat> Before we look at the Word of God, let's pray together. Once again, Father, we're thankful and grateful that we are found together with your people, Lord, and that you are in our midst. We thank you for that. We pray this evening, Lord, you would lead us, you would guide us, you would open up our hearts, our minds, our understanding, Lord, that we might see great and wonderful things in your law, that you might be glorified in it all, Lord. Come, we pray, lead us into your truth, teach us, Lord, and we pray that you alone would be glorified. And when we go from one another, that our hearts could acknowledge it was good to have been together this evening. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, one of the most successful companies in the fast food industry is apparently Domino's, Domino's Pizza, I was reading. I don't even know if they're still going. I think they are. But the founder of the company had a very clearly defined statement of mission. And this was it. Domino's has a single goal. It's mission to deliver a high quality pizza, hot, within 30 minutes at a fair price. Everything they do at Domino's says the, C the founder is centered on that goal. As a church, I'm talking about the church throughout the world and our church, is everything centered on the great commission that Jesus gave us? in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. I want to look at the deliverance of Israel from a desperate famine in the reign of King Joram, the son of Ahab, a very wicked man. The context is that there was a siege and a famine. The times were desperate for everyone, but deliverance was coming. Now, we read that a great multitude of Israelites had already perished, but here in the beginning, the good news of deliverance came through the word of the Lord. And we're told there's the promise. The Lord gave his word to Elisha. Imagine that. The Lord gave his word to Elisha. Lord spoke through the prophets. And in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son and by his son. What a, an amazing privilege it is for us to have the word of the Lord. It is our word to live by and how important it is to hear the word of the Lord. And Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. And it's important tonight that you and I hear that because the word of the Lord is a sure word. And the word that Elisha had for the desperate Israelites was that there was going to be deliverance. Tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. That was the word of the Lord, it couldn't fail. But what happened, the captain, a king's nobleman whose arm the king leaned on, refused the word of the Lord. He, he, he dismissed it. A great gospel privilege. Dismissed, not only dismissed, but scorned. He mocked the word of the Lord. He despised the grace 
and the power of the Lord. And really when he said, you know, if the Lord himself should make a window in heaven, could this thing happen? And what he was basically saying is, the word used means, you know, if the Lord was to make floodgates in heaven or sluice gates, could food rain from heaven? And of course, we know that God did send food from heaven. So this man was very, very dismissive of the word of God. A great privilege scorned. He mocked the word of the Lord, and sadly, the end was inevitable in his case. But judgment was announced. You shall not, you shall see it with your own eyes. The word of the Lord came, but you shall not eat of it. So the promise of God's deliverance was despised. But the provision of God was promised for deliverance, and there were four desperate men. So I want to look at the provision for these four desperate men. What can we learn about them? There's three things we can learn about them. They were, they were desperate. They discovered the blessing, and they found that they had a duty to fulfill. Now, the, the lepers were at the entrance to the gate which means they were not inside the walled city. They were outside the community. They were social outcasts, and they were religious outcasts. They were in isolation, in quarantine, as lepers. They were ritually unclean. Now, leprosy could cover a whole variety of skin diseases and clinical leprosy which for so long was the worst kind of disease incurable and so it really has a strong symbolism for sin and separation it's known as Hansen's disease and hor horribly people literally fell apart such a graphic picture of the destructive power and effects of sin. There was a separation because no leper could come into the community. No leper could worship God uh, in, the, in the worshiping community. They had to stand apart. They were ritually unclean. Now, these four lepers, they were desperate men. Their, their condition was desperate because of their leprosy. And even so, they were starving. Their condition was doubly desperate. They considered their situation and felt going to the camp of the Syrians. There was a, a glimmer of hope. Any other option, they were bound to die. The Syrians could not do more than kill them, which would certainly happen if they were to stay where they were, they would die. But perchance the Syrians could feed them and let them live, which was not an option in other places. They were starving, the famine was great, and that the price of any available food was extortionate. Uh, now, to give you some idea, we can read in chapter 6 that a donkey's head was sold at an exorbitant price. And dove's dung, uh, yeah, dove's dung at an exorbitant price. Now, the Hebrew in some translations is harionim, dove's dung, but it can also be written Har Ubim, which means carob seeds or pods. And it could have been a derogatory name for a very low class, a rough seed. And uh, it is translated dove's pigeon's droppings. 
the word, like we said, may have been used of a certain type of rough seed that could feed animals, but was almost worthless as food. And now was so expensive. Desperately hungry people may well have eaten dove's dung. Both donkey, donkey head and animal refuse are unclean. Donkey was an unclean animal, yet people were eating it. They didn't have time to think about what was clean or unclean. Yet people were willing to buy this. The famine was so bad, we read in chapter 6, that cannibalism was resorted to. Children were being eaten. We can read that in verse 28 when the king, uh, Joram, meets two women, one woman in chapter 6, verse 28, and the king asked her, what is your trouble? She answered, this woman said to me, give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And the next day I said to her, give your son that we may eat him, but she has hidden her son. When the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. Now he was passing by on the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth be beneath on his body. And he said, may God do so to me, and more also. Listen to this. If the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. You see, the king was blaming Elisha, and we'll find out why. And the king was blaming God. Not his own sin or his own arrogance or his hypocrisy of having sackcloth underneath his clothes. At the Leningrad siege, starving people mixed sawdust into gruel and boiled their leather belts for stock. They were a desperate lack of food. And it, it's a fact that police records released years later showed that 2,000 people were arrested for cannibalism. 586 of them were executed for murdering their victims. People were robbing morgues, limbs were disappearing. This was how grim the situation was. Most people arrested, however, were women. Mothers smothered very young children to feed their older ones. That's the distressing effects of sin. In Ukraine, the famine with the crop failure caused over 3 million to die. Some, some suggestions say that Stalin withheld food from them. But cannibalism was not so unusual in times of great famine. And actually, cannibalism was one of the judgments of God for disobedience to the covenant. We can read that in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, and uh, Ezekiel chapter 5. It was to befall Jerusalem both in Old Testament times, we can read about it in Lamentations, and in the New Testament times. The, the Jewish wars by Josephus, uh, a, hist a Jewish historian, records the cannibalism then. What a dreadful, dreadful, desperate time this was for Jerusalem. There, and these lepers, their predicament was indeed desperate. And desperate measures were not only considered, but decided on. They were ready to do or die. Their decision was, let's go. They had made a decision. Life is full of choices and decisions. Even the choice not to make a decision is in itself a decision. The predicament of sinners without the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior is truly desperate. A decision is needed for Jesus, not later, not at any other time, but today, now is the accepted time.
the Holy Spirit teaches us. Not deciding for Jesus is a decision to be without God and to be without Christ. And to be without God and to be without Christ is to be without hope. How we need to accept the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. These lepers are, are poignantly and graphically symbolic of the desperate condition of poor sinners without Christ perishing. Why would anyone wait without hope perishing when Christ is calling poor sinners to come to him? These poor lepers said, why are we sitting here until we die when there was an opportunity to look for mercy? And that's what they were looking for, mercy at the hands of the Syrians. They didn't know whether they would be shown mercy. That is the exact opposite for the sinner who comes to Jesus. The sinner who comes to Jesus, Jesus has promised he will never drive anyone away. He who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. God is merciful. And how sinners, how people, men and women, boys and girls, need to throw themselves on the mercy of God. Throw yourself on his mercy. He will never drive you away. His love is glorious. His word is sure. Hear the word of the Lord. He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Nobody can deny that word. So the lepers, their, their decision, their desperation, their decision, their discovery in, in the provision, they arose at twilight, clearly cautious and afraid. They made their way to the Syrian camp. What trepidation must have been theirs? What anxiety in their hearts? They did not know how they would be received. They were enemies to the Syrians. The discovery was amazing. Behold, an exclamation, an announcement. Behold, check this out. There was no one there. The camp was deserted. They came to the camp looking for the mercy of the Syrians, but instead found the mercy of God in their deliverance from starvation and certain death. Far from hostility, captivity, torture, or death, they got a glorious banquet, food, treasures, clothing. This, friends, is reminiscent of the gospel feast. Christ can prepare a table in the wilderness. He did it for Elijah. He came to Elijah. The very Christ of heaven came and prepared a table in the wilderness for, our, for Elijah. And here he prepared for the lepers, the provision. They experienced the glorious provision of God. God provides for us. He's provided a savior. They had left at twilight and significantly at the same time, the Syrians had fled. God's timing. God's provision and his timing are perfect. The Lord had caused the Syrians to panic, believing the noise they heard was a mercenary force of Hittites and Egyptians hired by Israel. They fled from what they thought was a great army with horses and chariots. Sadly, we're reminded of the fall of Singapore when the British, it was the greatest defeat and humiliation in the British army when Singapore commanders surrendered because they heard the noise of the Japanese bicycles without tires and it sounded like the treads of tanks. Here, the Syrians fled from what they thought was a great army of horses and chariots. They abandoned their tents, horses, donkeys. The lepers went in and ate their fill, and they carried off treasure and came back again for more. Sinners are enemies of God, yet when sinners humble themselves 
and throw themselves on the Lord's mercy. We, they are received, we are received and provided for so amazingly because it is while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. We were once God's enemies and he sent his son to die for us. And he has made a glorious, gracious provision for us. In Christ, we become the Lord's children and are treated as his children, provided for. The lepers had received so much, much more than they thought they could have. That is the way it is for us in Jesus, dear friends. We have been given so much, and we're told that to whom much is given, much is required. The lepers realized that they had a duty. The duty of the lepers, they were convicted of their lack of action. We are not doing right, they said. And here comes the third point, the proclamation in the deliverance. There was the promise, there was the provision. Now there is the proclamation in the deliverance. They had a duty to their brethren. They had a message to tell. This is a day of good news. I remember a friend of mine, David Joy, telling me uh, the story of a co-pilot and a pilot who had been together on many flights. And then the co-pilot was converted and the first thing he did was tell the pilot, and the pilot then told him that he was a Christian as well. And he said, you, you're a Christian, and you never told me, he said, all these times that we flew together. And the pilot, of course, had a duty to witness on the side of Christ. This, the lepers realized, we are not doing right, they said. They had a duty to their brethren. They had a message, good news to tell this day. This is a day of good news. What a glorious gospel text this is. This was a wonderful blessing for the people. They could not keep silent about this. This was good news indeed, friends. This is a wonderful gospel truth. We cannot keep silent about the good news. Let us go and tell the king's household. They proclaimed the good news to the gatekeeper. And we've probably heard the story of one beggar telling another beggar where he can find bread. That is the gospel of grace. We are all beggars at the throne of grace. The gatekeeper, gatekeepers called out and it was told, within the king's household. Joram was a wicked and faithful, faithless man. Like we said, he was the son of Ahab and Jezebel. He was not from the line of David. At the end of chapter 6, he wanted Elisha's head. When the king heard the words of the woman, he tore his clothes. And then he said, May God do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. He blamed God and he blamed Elisha because in chapter 6, he also says, this trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? So he was blaming the Lord and he wanted Elisha's head. And then we're told, after this proclamation, while he was still speaking, the messenger came down and said to him, the trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Earlier in chapter 6, Elisha had led the Syrian soldiers back to the city. This is an amazing thing, this, when we think of it. The Lord had blinded them as to where they were going, and Joram wanted to kill them. But Elisha stopped him. God forbid that you should do that. Rather, he organized a feast for them. What kindness and mercy. And perhaps King Joram was looking and blamed Elisha for not allowing him to destroy the army there and then. 
because at a later date, Ben Hadid returned with an army. But here now, the feast is at the expense of the Syrians. And it's for the starving multitudes in Israel. And this feast is a feast of God's grace. The lepers knew that they had good news for the city. The gatekeepers relayed the message to the king's household. Now, why did the lepers decide to go to the Syrians? We don't know. We're, we're not told, apart from the fact that they knew they would die if they didn't. But the gatekeepers brought word of the Lord to the king from Militia. Perhaps, sorry, the, the gatekeepers brought the word of the Lord, the, the word, the good news to the king from the lepers. Perhaps the gatekeepers brought the word of the Lord from Militia to the lepers at the gate. And they said, well, if God is in this, Surely he will bless us. They were encouraged to hope, perhaps, through the word of the Lord, the promise that Elisha bought, brought. Whatever they decided to venture out, they were hoping in mercy, and they were not disappointed. It was God's mercy. This is an, an amazing gospel missionary text. We have a greater good news for a lost and dying world. Leprosy shows the symbol of the, the corruption and the destructive power of sin and the separation of sin. The situation for humanity is desperate. In a sin-sick, fallen humanity, we have the glorious gospel, the good news, the glad tidings of great joy. We have the good news of our blessed, sinless Savior, who came to us and became sin for us, who suffered death on the cross and rose again. He died for us. He defeated death and sin and Satan. Jesus, he went into the enemy's camp and he disarmed him. He routed the principalities and the powers, triumphing over them by the cross. He was the one who suffered and died outside the camp of his people, the people of God. He went into the enemy territory, to that place of forsakenness, alone and forsaken by God and by man. He bore our sin in his own body, the leprosy of sin that broke his body. He became a curse for us, that we might receive the blessing of God, that we might be freed from the curse. This is a victory. He defeated all his enemies and all our enemies and rose to give us the victory and the glorious hope of the resurrection unto eternal life, which is victory over and above every victory. He has all power and friends, the lepers were dividing the spoils, but he, the Lord Jesus, is the one who is dividing the spoils of his victory with us, his people. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressor. We have the spoils of the victory of Jesus Christ. And friends, we have a glorious inheritance kept for us through and in Jesus. So the glorious gospel, the promise of it, the provision of it, the glorious deliverance, the proclamation of it, and finally, the punishment for the rejection of it. The nobleman who mockingly despised the word of God and the prophet of God was trampled beneath the rush to get to the Syrian camp. Elisha had given the sure word of the Lord in verse 1. In verse 2, 
the sure word of the Lord was brought to pass. The danger of rejecting the word of the Lord when we hear the word of the Lord. We are blessed to have it and to believe it. The lepers brought their good news to the gatekeepers. The word of the Lord was sure through Elisha, but the king was still unbelieving. He had not believed the word of the Lord, and he still refused the testimony of the lepers. Rather, he sent out others who brought the same good news back to him. Friends, the word of the Lord and the faithful testimony of his people can be trusted. May the Lord bless his word to us. The great deliverance, the good news of the deliverance, the glorious gospel. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for our time together, and we thank you, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ and the glorious gospel of grace. We thank you, Lord, that you came to us while we were still your enemies, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we thank you, Lord, for the glorious gospel feast, the gospel banquet that you have provided for us. And we pray, Lord, that continually we would be setting forth and holding forth Christ in love and gentleness and respect to all who want, Lord, the reason for the hope that is in us. And we pray, Lord, that in days to come, you would give us opportunities and that we would be humble and wise in taking them and that your name, Lord, would be glorified in it. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask it. And for his sake, Lord, amen. We're going to sing our last item of praise now, which is another lovely gospel him, God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name I come to you to share his love as he told me to. Not to worry about whether we've been prepared for the gospel or whether we're suitably contrite or whether we're uh, in a suitably humble mode. Come to Christ the way we are, because he won't leave us the way we are. God forgive my sin in Jesus' name. God forgive my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said, freely, freely, you have received, freely, freely give. Go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live. All power is given in Jesus' name, in earth and heaven, in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name. I come to you to share his power as he told me to. He said, freely, freely you have received, freely, freely give. Go in my name and because you believe, Others will know that I live.
Now we do pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit would rest upon you and remain upon you and all whom you love now and forevermore. Amen.